So let's put our hands together now and give a great Iron Range welcome to a guy that always stuck up for Main Street instead of Wall Street, that always sticks up for our pension funds and not those billionaires' hedge funds. Let's put our hands together for the guy who, in the words of the late great Senator Paul Wellstone used to say, has always been for the little fellers and not the Rockefellers. Come on, let's welcome Bernie Sanders. Feel the burn! It's an honor for me to be here in the Iron Range, and it is an honor for me to have met with the Steelworkers Local 1938. And I thank them very much for this beautiful jacket, which I will wear with pride. Now, I don't have to explain to anybody in this room that our country today faces some very, very serious problems. And I'm running for President of the United States because in my heart of hearts, I simply do not believe that establishment politics and establishment economics is going to do what has to be done for the working families and the middle class. We are today the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. But very few people know that because almost all of the new income and wealth is going to the top 1%. Everybody here knows that we have a rigged economy. Working. <laughs> Average worker working longer hours for lower wages. People in my state, Minnesota, working two or three jobs. 58% of all new income generated goes to the top 1%. So mom is working, dad's working, the kids are working. And yet, at the end of the day, 58% of all new income goes to the top 1%. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about some of the differences between uh, Secretary Clinton and myself, uh, because they touch on these very issues. When we talk about why it is that the middle class of this country is disappearing and why we see so much income and wealth inequality, one of the reasons is a series of disastrous trade policies. And the steel workers and I were just talking about this a moment ago. And you don't need to have a PhD in economics to understand what these trade agreements were about. I understood it in the early 1990s. These trade agreements were written by corporate America with a very simple purpose. What corporate America said is, why do I want to pay workers in Minnesota 20, 25, 30 bucks an hour when I could shut down plants in manufacturing facilities and mines here in this country. I can go abroad, pay people nickels an hour, and bring the products back into this country. That's it. Two sentences. That's what trade policy is about. Now, you are looking at a former congressman and a United States senator who said, not only will I not vote for NAFTA, I'm going to help lead the opposition to NAFTA. And I, voted, and I voted against CAFTA, and I voted against permanent normal trade relations with China. And today, I'm helping in the Senate to lead the opposition to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I do understand what's going on up here in the Iron Range. 
about the loss of many, many, many hundreds of good paying jobs because cheap Chinese steel is being dumped into the United States of America. And together, we are going to end that. So the bottom line with regard to trade, not a very radical idea, but we need trade agreements which work for working families, not just the CEOs of large multinational corporations. And when you talk about a rigged economy, you also have to talk about a corrupt campaign finance system. Because they are tied together. Nothing is separated from each other. Everything ties into everything else. So what you got right now is a result of this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision. You now have billionaires, wealthiest people in this country, Wall Street, pouring huge amounts of money into the political process. In essence, buying elections. Now, when you have a handful of billionaire families, and when you have Wall Street pouring huge amounts of money into the political process, this is a scary, scary situation. I know we have veterans out in the audience, men and women who have put their lives on the line to fight for American democracy. When a billionaire can buy an election, that's not democracy, that is oligarchy. Yeah. I made a decision early on that I would not be begging Wall Street or corporate America or the billionaire class for funds. We decided we do not want a super PAC. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Somebody, somebody said the other day, they stood up in the audience, they said, Bernie, we are your super PAC. And you are a super, super PAC, and I thank you for that. And I'd rather have you on my side a million times over than all the money in the world from Wall Street. Now, my opponent has a different position. She has a super PAC, and in the last reporting period, uh, her super PAC, her major super PAC, received 25 million, 15 million of which came from Wall Street. The war in Iraq was the worst foreign policy blunder that this country has made in many, many decades. I led the opposition to that war. Secretary Clinton voted for that war. We have a difference on those issues. We are where we are today. And it is imperative that we go beyond establishment politics because we are fighting a fight for the survival of the middle class and the working class of this country. When workers lose decent paying jobs, especially if they have a union behind them, they end up working in Walmarts or McDonald's for half the wages, less than half the wages, with minimal benefits. That is not the future of this country that I want to see for our children and our grandchildren. We have got to rebuild our manufacturing sector, create decent paying jobs here. And the other thing we have to do, and I know every man in this room will stand, stand with the women, 
and that is to make certain that we have pay equity for women workers in this country. There is no rational economic reason why a woman should be making 79 cents on the dollar doing the same work as a man. That's sexism. We're going to end that. So you want a radical idea? Here's a radical idea, that we're going to invest in jobs and education for those kids on the reservations, those kids in the ghettos. Invest in jobs and education, not jails and incarceration. Now, I am told this morning that half of the kids, Native American kids around here, do not graduate high school in the normal four years. Well, we're going to change that. We're going to give kids the education that they need and we're going to get kids the jobs that they need, because when kids have education and jobs, there is a strong likelihood that they're not going to turn to opiates and heroin, and they're not going to get themselves in trouble. So let's invest in our kids. <laughs> I believe that in the year 2016, when we talk about public education, it's not good enough just to talk about first grade through 12th grade. It is important to say that public education means that every public college and university in this country should be tuition free. Now, why is that important? It's important not only that it will enable young people to go out and get good jobs. And I came from a family, never had any money. My dad dropped out of high school. My mother graduated high school. But what it means to the people here, to the kids here in Hibbing and all over this country, is that if they know, if their parents know, if their teachers know, that those kids do their schoolwork seriously, they will, in fact, be able to get a post-high school education regardless of the income of their families. Yeah. That's a radical idea. Yeah. Let me touch on another issue that impacts every single one of us. And that is that as a member of the Senate Energy Committee and the Senate Environmental Committee, I have talked to scientists all over this world. And what they say almost unanimously is that climate change is real. It is caused by human activity. It is already doing devastating problems, causing devastating problems in our country and all over the world. And what they tell us is if we do not get our act together, if we do not transform our energy system away from fossil fuel into energy efficiency and sustainable energy, the planet that we're going to be leaving, our children and our grandchildren, is a planet that will not be healthy or particularly habitable. We have a moral responsibility moral responsibility to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel. And by the way, when you make that transformation, we can create millions of decent paying jobs, building the solar panels we need, building them here in America, not in China. What our campaign is about is talking, is essentially telling the American people truth. And sometimes they're unpleasant truths. And here is the unpleasant truth. We have a corrupt campaign finance system dominated by big money. We have a rigged economy, 
by which the middle class is shrinking, people on top are doing phenomenally well, and we have a broken criminal justice system. Now, I am criticized every single day. What people say to me is, Bernie, you know, you think too big. Your ideas are too grandiose. You're asking for too much for the working families of America. How dare you? And let me respond in two ways. Number one, I find it interesting that over the last 30 years, there has been a massive redistribution of wealth in this country. You all know that? Problem is, it's gone in the wrong direction. Middle class, working class have lost wealth. Top one-tenth of one percent have seen a doubling of their wealth. Well, it's kind of what this camp, you know, and I hear the establishment, they're very worried about my proposals. How dare you think so big and it's so expensive. Where was the establishment worrying when the middle class was disappearing and trillions of dollars in wealth going from the middle class to the top one-tenth of one percent. I didn't see big editorials in the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post worrying about that massive shift of wealth. But now, because we are talking about creating an economy that works for all Oh, my goodness, they are so worried. So let me tell you this. When I talk about making public colleges and universities tuition free, we're going to pay for that by a tax on Wall Street speculation. Our government bailed out Wall Street now it is Wall Street's time to help the middle class of this country. Now, I want to touch on another issue where I have been criticized for. And that is, again, I'm thinking too big. You know, I'm, I'm asking too much. And I am saying, I am saying, why is it that if the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Holland, all of Scandinavia, Italy, Canada, in fact, every major country on earth can guarantee health care to all of their people. Why can't we do that in the United States of America? Now, in my view, the Affordable Care Act has done a lot of good things, and I'm on the committee that helped write the Affordable Care Act. What we have done is done away with this obscenity, private insurance company obscenity of pre-existing conditions. All right? We have done away with discrimination against women who are paying higher premiums because they are women. We have, we have added 17 million Americans into the ranks of the insured all of that is a good thing. But today, 29 million Americans still have no health insurance. And many of you, if I am not mistaken, have high deductibles and high copayments. Am I right? Yeah. All right. And that is where we are today as a nation. There are some people out there, people like Trump and others, who want to who want to divide us up. They think they can get votes by making bigoted and racist remarks about Latinos or telling us that we're supposed to hate Muslims. Now, among other things, yes. All right, but my view is that we will stand or fall as a nation depending on whether we stand together. Black and white and Native American and Latino. Men and women and gay and straight, we're all in this together. And when we stand together, and when we have the courage to take on greedy 
selfish, powerful special interests, whether it is Wall Street, whether it's the fossil fuel industry, whether it is the pharmaceutical industry, people who are only concerned about their own short-term profits and could care less about the American people. If we come together and make what I call a political revolution, bring millions of people into the political process, my friends, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish. That's what this campaign is about. On Tuesday, here in Minnesota, we've got a very, very important election. I urge you to come out to the caucuses. I urge you to participate, to bring your friends and your neighbors. If we can win here in Minnesota, we've got a real path to victory for the Democratic nomination. Thank you all very much.